Friday, 29th of May, Hunsford Villa of Liberty Givers and Takers. Dear Sir, Precisely. As a general rule, I do my best to not concern myself with that I cannot help. I have seldom found it to change anything for the better, but have likewise noticed that the successful deflection of my mind provides, at the very least, a strong sense of relief instead. When we sincerely love, we wish the very best for the objects of our affection. But in the muddle of life, our petty concerns can confuse and misdirect our feelings. With the release of these concerns, love remains. But I repeat myself. You speak of allowance and kindness. As your papa once said, you must give this to yourself. And... Think only of the past as its remembrance gives you pleasure. Truly. I would offer a suggestion regarding Mr. Berg and her application of masks, which you are at liberty to take or leave. Your cousin seeks expression for her frustrations, but may not do so directly for fear of repercussion. I am certain that she will never find lasting peace or happiness, while she believes your aunt's approval to be the source of either. I fear she is unlikely ever to have Lady Catherine's compassion towards her will, for, if readily available, it would have shown itself by now. Your cousin's self-compassion, however, is inherently assured, if she will allow it. When she is able to release her anger, privately, and to then turn away from the past, which cannot be helped, towards the future, which can, then, I believe, she will find a place of lasting self-assurance. And should she find her mother still intractable, it will not matter so. I appreciate your words on the master of paddles. A new perspective is always refreshing. Although I cannot offer sympathy with his behaviour, I may with the root of it. The questioning of the sanity of his wife as an aid to concealment, however, is a matter beyond my acceptance. On this, Mamma and I are, for once, in complete agreement. She was particularly shocked indeed to learn that such matters were discussed before his children. Does he not consider, Mr. Bennet, she has exclaimed to Papa on several occasions, that the children might believe it and then consider it their own inescapable future? I would not do a child of mine so great a wrong for all the world. She can be quite wise, Mamma, on the subject of children. I have had cause recently, as you may know, to consider a path that did not feel my own for the sake of others. For the briefest moment, I felt the weight many feel almost constantly to make a decision that does not accord with their idea of happiness and desires for their own future. There is a stubbornness about me, however, which I cherish, for I will not be intimidated by the will of another. I allowed myself freedom, sanctioned by Papa. I am forever grateful to him. I know for certain now what instinct alone guided me towards before, that had I bent to the will of another, looked to another for my own path in life, my unhappiness would have been great indeed. We must allow ourselves choice. We must understand also that where there is uncertainty, there is often no decision yet to make. Now that Mr. Collins has recovered fully from the unmentionable, he has begun an intense investigation as to its originator. Mamma behaves similar whenever she contracts a cold. The household is thoroughly interrogated, staff included, until she determines the culprit usually Kitty, and holds them to account by grumbling. His current favourites are a household from Rochester, who moved lock, stock and barrel last week, in a cart with rusty wheels drawn by an old nag Charlotte, and before the hallowed walls of Rosings, has been his constant lament. We hear his sobs at night. The fact that they should not have moved during lockdown has not escaped his notice. The fact that they were many miles hence when he contracted the unmentionable has. 
Charlotte, they have a bath in the garden, he cries in despair. What a pleasure that must be, dear, in the summer months, she responds without a pause. Charlotte, their eldest child, plays the violin very ill indeed. Oh, what a pleasure that will be, dear, when he is older and more proficient. Charlotte, they are all so terribly loud all of the time. Why, we are all louder than we know, my dear. Go into your study and close your eyes for an hour or so. Upon investigation of my own, it transpires that Mr. Collins has a dislike of those from the north of Kent. Impossible to comprehend why. It transpires that another near neighbour may, or may not, have been feeding Mr. Collins's geese. It is no wonder, really, as he has shown a tendency to tether creatures, that they might conspire to flee to more exalted ground. One must never underestimate the ricochet which occurs when attempting to force to one's will a being who considers itself inherently free. Speaking of which, Felicity is once more fully at liberty. I had it arranged that as soon as Mr. Collins caught and collared her again, either myself, Charlotte or Maria, indeed whomsoever was nearest, would instantly free her once more. After many days' amusement, Mr. Collins finally relented in exhaustion and is now furious with me. He has ceased all verbal communication and avoids me, but to leave letters upon the drawing-room table or under my door, referring to his, underlined several times, cat. Charlotte assures me that Felicity was always feral, and that Mr. Collins paid her no heed prior, except for the odd kick, but he is not to be reasoned with. Thus, I fear, you spoke too soon regarding his rise in my esteem. Yours, etc. P.S. My reply to the Colonel is enclosed. I expect we might see you all, at a safe distance, on Sunday, for Mr. Collins's eagerly anticipated missive from the church tower. P.P.S. It is a long-held and rather foolish belief that a man in possession of a donkey must be in want of a dog. I just thought you should know. Saturday, 30th of May, Rosings Temple of Concord, which may I trust fare better than the Hugh Temple of Peace. Dear Madam, I confess I too am curious as to how Mr. Collins came by the unmentionable, especially as both yourself and the Lucas sisters have, thankfully, avoided the same so too concerning we three miscreants and her ladyship. Unlike Mr. Collins, however, Lady Catherine has no need to conduct an intensive investigation, having decided long ago that she most likely contracted the unmentionable from either myself or the Colonel being interlopers to Rosings. The Colonel particularly has been most unpopular since her recovery, although this may be as a result of his ill-conceived celebration dance. Yesterday, Anne, owing to that extensive morning thunderstorm, returned early from outdoor exercise to discover Mrs Norris within her chamber, overseen by my aunt, searching through possessions hidden within a trunk. Inevitably, to my aunt's horror and dismay, these included several questionable books. Two by notorious lexicographers, Messrs. Head and Gross. I am sure neither publication is known to you, so I will go no further. Suffice it to say, there were heated words exchanged, unhampered by any lack of clarity or volume. In the evening, having had no clear platform yet to offer your ideas to Anne, I took it upon myself to act as mediator between my aunt and she. 
I am now in a similar position to yourself regarding Mr. Collins, for neither will speak a word to me. But there is, at least, peace of a kind. Much to my incredulity, I am in agreement with your mamma regarding the protection of young minds. Indeed, I am furnished, it seems, with an example firsthand, for Anne having evolved beside a mother who never forgets the slightest slight, is herself, at present, completely immersed in every wrong ever done to her, whether intended or no. A circumstance most surely intensified by both our continuing confinement, with no clear knowledge of when it might end, and the dampness which has replaced the early days of blue skies and warmth. The Colonel has been called away to attend to a ripple of unrest, where he was not at liberty to say but he has given his full assurance that there is no cause whatsoever for alarm, and nothing out of the ordinary. Could anything at present be described as ordinary? Thus, he wishes you to know, regretfully, that he will not be in attendance tomorrow morn, and that the letter I enclose will be his last for a time. I may not hazard a guess as to where he is sent, or for what. Indeed, it would be foolish of me so to do. We must be of good cheer, and hold faith with his words. Question. If you might steer change in the world in but three ways, which would you choose? It may, or may not, amuse you to hear that Miss Bingley, having uncovered a pronounced aptitude for illustration in her brother's valet, has commissioned the man in addition to his present duties, to sketch her in a series of lockdown ensembles, and then reproduce these to send to a multitude of correspondents. I have little idea why I am one such recipient, having not the slightest interest in fashion. Perhaps I might send them on to you? Yours, etc. P.S. I thank you regarding the dog and donkey. I am now much the wiser. P.P.S. I fear my aunt and Mr. Collins are likely to have an agreement of the most violent kind regarding your recent neighbours. Mrs. Norris first drew attention to their freshly renovated dwelling at breakfast, informing her ladyship that in her humble opinion it was an abomination of the very worst kind. My aunt was out of the house and within her carriage before one might say multum stacora in parvum spatium. She returned pale and speechless. Mm.